All right, and we are recording. It is currently, what is today's date? Today is the 18th. Oh my gosh, it's the 18th. Wow. We are, what is that? 32 days away from Christmas, something like that. Think of it that way. Get your Christmas shopping done. 32 days till Christmas. Uh, last we spoke, we were talking about the center of mass and center of gravity, right? And I had mentioned, do you guys remember where I said about the center of gravity is in the human body? The center of mass? The hips. Right, right in the hips, exactly. And, that, and when you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because if the center of mass was like in our chest, we'd be all over the place. So for a human, what can throw off your center of gravity? Well, obviously drinking, right? We talked about that way in excess. Get it in excess. <laughs> anyway, what else can throw off your center of gravity? Like another force. Okay, another force, good, right? Something that shoves you. Right. Neurological disability. Yep, neurological disabilities. You can sometimes, ladies, get a parasite growing inside of you that throws off your center of gravity, right? Usually parasite lasts inside of you about nine months. And then he, he or she escapes, right? When you're pregnant, that definitely throws off your center of gravity, right? <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? Think of the definition of a parasite. A parasite is an organism that feeds on its host. A baby is a parasite. Just saying. And they continue to be a parasite for sometimes longer than 18 years after that. Um, but so when you think about that, right, that'll throw off your center of gravity. What happens if you start getting obese? Is that going to throw off your center of gravity? Yeah, right? Especially if you get what I like to call Dunlap's disease. Does anyone know what Dunlap's disease is? It's where your belly Dunlaps over your belt. Ah, uh, some of you got it. Okay, good. Right? When patients have that thing called the panis, right? That's the thing we always love in healthcare when they have that big panis that kind of rolls over and you have those deep crevasses that stuff can get stuck in. They're like, oh, a slice of pizza. Um, so that can throw off, right? What happens if I lose an arm? Is that going to throw off my center of gravity? You yeah. don't think about it, but yeah. Right, you use your arms for balance, even though you're not actually, it's not like you're holding on to stuff. But when you're walking, you have a reciprocal swing going on. Now you don't have that arm for a reciprocal swing. What's gonna happen? Well, your energy level is gonna go up and your balance is gonna be off. Definitely, if you lose a leg, that kind of definitely affects your balance, right? That can be a problematic. But yeah, so all of that can throw off everything. Even if you lose a lot of weight, there have been studies that have shown that People take when they lose a ton of weight, you know, when they go from like the 400 pounds down to 180 or whatever it is from diet and dieting and, you know, surgery and stuff like that, their balance gets thrown off for a while. So they're so used to being heavy that they don't feel right. And they'll talk to those, you hear them say, I don't feel right in my own body because their body hasn't adjusted to that new mass level. So it's just interesting. So we're talking about centripetal force. Right, we're going to talk about centripetal, and then we're going to talk about centrifugal, because a lot of times you'll hear stuff in the hospital where they say they put something in a centrifuge. And a centrifuge is a device, centrifugal force really doesn't exist. So centripetal force on an object depends upon the object's tangential speed, its mass, and the radius. So the speed of which you're spinning is going to affect your centripetal force. Your mass is going to affect it because your mass is directly related to your inertia, right? Again, the bigger you are, the harder it is for you to move. And that becomes a big kind of um, thing in our field because you know, when patients start getting heavy and start gaining weight, what happens is it becomes a snowball effect, right? It's a lot harder for them to get going. And we talked about velocity, right? That it involves both speed and direction. So if you're going in a circle, even if you're going at a constant speed, you're always going in a different, velo or a different velocity because your direction is changing, right? This is what I talked about with those NASCAR drivers. When they're going around that track, they're constantly changing velocity. They may drive the same speed, but they're constantly changing velocity because of that change. So what's gonna cause us to experience centripetal force? Well, an object going in a circle, that's what's gonna cause us to feel this centripetal force. 
there is a force that is directed towards the circle or towards the center, which is called centripetal acceleration. We experience centripetal force on a daily basis. Right now where you are sitting, you're experiencing a centripetal force. What force is that you're experiencing just sitting here? Does anyone know? Any idea? No direction, linear. Yeah, well, you're not, we're all going in a direction, right? Gravity. Gravity is a centripetal force, right? Our planet has mass, it's spinning around. So because of its spin and its mass, we're getting that attraction to the earth. That's a centripetal force, right? We're pulled towards the center. So we talked about the location of gravity back with that, right? And we talked about the S2. I don't know how this slide ended up here. It should be back there. I got to fix that. So centripetal means towards the center. It's a force directed at a fixed center that causes an object to follow a circular path. So for the Earth, what would officially be the center of our circle as we're moving around in space? Now, it's more of an ellipse, but... The sun. The sun, right? So the sun has a centripetal force that keeps the earth attracted, right? Because the sun has such huge mass, right? It keeps all of the planets attached. So if you take a tin can and you spin it around, right? While you're spinning it around over your head, or you know, a, if any of you ever used a sling or anything like that, you are exerting an, an inward pull on that string, whether you know it or not, to keep that can spinning in a circle. Right? If you alter the amount of pull you have, that circle changes, right? If you do it light, it may spin around your body and kind of at a cone. You do it faster, it'll spin around your head, and then you spin it faster and it'll cone upwards. That pull that you're giving on that string is a centripetal force. Now, what happens if we put maybe a ladybug in that can? So you have an open can, you stick a ladybug in it and you start spinning it around in circles. Where is the ladybug going to feel the force at? It's going to feel like it's being pushed outward, right? Because you get that squish effect against the wall, like in those uh, amusement park rides. So you get that pull towards the center. It's toward the fixed center. So we whirl a can over a string. We exert a force on it. Here we get somebody doing, I think this is shot put, right? I don't know. I don't follow the Olympics too much. I think that's called a shot put. Maybe. No, it's not shot put. That's something else. I have no idea what that is. String and a ball. That's what I'm going to call it. Um, but you're constantly going to be pulling that towards the center. If you let go of that pull towards the center, what's going to happen? So you're whirling that can overhead, and all of a sudden, you just let go of that pull. The can's going to go zooming off, right? And it's usually the straight direction on which you started. The same idea what would happen if we lost the pull to the, the sun. So the moon itself is closer to a circular path than the earth is as far as following around a planetary body, right? The string that holds the moon to us is gravity. In an atom, right? What are the, part, what are the three main parts of an atom? Do you remember that? Because we're going to talk about that in a couple, upcoming lecture. But Neutrons, protons, electrons. Good. So the newts, the protons, and the electrons. The electrons are in a circular path around the nucleus, right? And they're held in place by a centripetal force exerted by the protons, right? The positive versus the negative charges. It's not a basic force in nature, but it's a labeled A force give that pulls things to the center. When you go around a corner really fast, right? You can feel centripetal force because the car can slide if you go too fast, right? You hear the tires chirping as you're going around the corner. That's the effect of the actual centripetal force pulling the car inward. So if motion is circular and executed at a constant speed, the force acts at a right angle or a tangent or tangential to the path of the moving object. So here we have that car going around the curve, right? So this is what holds us into a curved path, right? You get out, you're going down I-15, and you want to get off on Flamingo. When you start getting off the ramp, there's a thing that says speed. Well, actually, Flamingo is a straight ramp. Let's say you're getting on a 215. That's a curved ramp. It says maximum speed, 25 miles an hour, right? And a lot of times you have people that are like, yeah, no, that's fine. I can do 90 around this corner. And somewhere down around the corner, they're off in the dirt because they didn't have enough centripetal force to hold them in place. 
For the car to go around a curve, there has to be sufficient friction. Which is going to have to go slower around a curve, a car or a tractor trailer truck? A truck? Yeah, the truck. truck. Why? What's different? Mass. 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 Right? Yeah. Now, what happens if, you know, we have a truck that has one mass, but a car that's going twice as fast? Well, that car could theoretically be harder to go around that corner than the truck going at a slow speed because of the speed as well. We have that acceleration to take in place. Could also be bad tires, right? If you ever had old tires, they eventually start stop gripping as much. If you see the tires that they use at the drag strip, they're completely bald because the only thing they're meant to do is go in a straight line. You take those slicks and you take them out on the road, car's not going very fast in round corners. It's same idea of your spin cycle in the washing machine, right? You put your clothes in and it washes them and does all the churning and smooshing all your clothes. And then all of a sudden it goes into a spin cycle. And so as that's spinning around, right? The centripetal force is holding the clothes in place, but the water is being exerted off, right? It's being flung off. If you took the outside wall off your washing machine and had that drum just sitting there spinning, your whole room would be soaked, right? All that water would just fly off in tangents because the water doesn't have enough friction to stay inside that circle. What's providing the friction for the clothes? Well, the outside wall of the washing machine. So why don't we have similar things for dishwashers? Wouldn't it make sense to put a spin cycle on a dishwasher? I mean, think of how much faster it would dry stuff. Of course, we'd also have less dishes because they'd all break. But I mean, hey, paper plates work well too. So greater speed and greater mass require greater centripetal force, right? That's the idea I just talked about the truck. And remember with most of the stuff, velocity, when you're talking about looking at forces, velocity is often squared. So that means that velocity or that speed is by far more important than even the mass. Because the faster you go, the harder it is to maintain control. Have any of you ever done like the um, uh, the NASCAR experience or there's an awesome F1 experience or you can go down the road, the BMW test track is down just south in California where you get to drive the really super fast cars. Have any of you ever done that? No, oh, yeah. but I want to. Oh, it's fun. Um, even the one that's down Speed Vegas, which is I highly recommend, I have a buddy that owns that one down just south of Vegas where you get to drive cars that you normally wouldn't be able to drive. It's really wild to get in one of those cars and drive them and not realize how fast you're actually going. Because, you know, you get in a, you especially get one of those stock cars and you're going 120 miles an hour, the car stick into the road like nothing and you feel like you're going 60. Field trip. Sounds like a plan, right? Let's see if I can get a class rate. I don't know. Actually, probably at this point, you'd probably take a class rate. It's not getting much business is what I'm saying. Um, but when we talk about centripetal force, it's measured in Newtons, right? Because it's the force. And we have to be important when we're dealing with these because usually mass is gonna be measured in kilograms. If it's measured in anything else, we have to convert it to kilograms. Purely for physics, exactly. Um, velocities in meters per second and radius is in meters. So if we have a larger circle, so let me get my little draw tool up here. Uh, where's my draw tool? There it is. All right. Let's change the color. So we have one corner that we're going around that is kind of that big. And we have another corner that's that big. Which of those is going to exert a greater, have a greater pull on that car going around the corner and possibly cause them to slide? The smaller, the smaller one. The smaller one. And here's why, because if you look at the bottom down here, right, the radius is our divisor. So that means the larger that radius becomes, the less this force is going to be, right? So when you're designing off ramps on highways and that, what do they want to make those curves? They want to make those curves as wide and as long as they can because, you know, not because they're thinking safety, because they're thinking of idiots, right? They're thinking about the people that see 35 miles an hour and say, I can do that in 90. So they kind of have to think about that. 
So then we have this mass here, right? We have mass, which is affected. Has anyone ever watched motorcycle racing? Yeah, okay, so I see Jason turning his head, nodding his head, right? Does anyone here have a motorcycle? Yeah, okay, good, All right? What's, what's different about going around a corner in a motorcycle than going around a corner in a car? Well, a lot, right? In a motorcycle, you don't typically turn the wheel because typically if you turn the wheel too much, you're going down. <laughs> you just lean. You lean, right? Well, why are we able to lean? Well, the motorcycles are able to use that centripetal force to go around that corner that cars aren't because their mass is so small, right? And if you ever see motorcycle racing, man, they lean. A lot of times they're dragging their knees on the road. They have those nice metal knee pads to protect themselves going around some of those corners. Like if you watch the Isle of Man or something like that, some of those races are intense when you see them go, I, like some of those scare me. You see them going around the corner and you're approaching a corner at like 120 miles an hour and they just zip right around it like nothing. You take that in the car and the car is going to go sliding off into the mess. Well, it's because of the mass of the vehicle, right? What about a motorcycle going around a curve like this? Jason, is that a lot of fun? Those wide, long curves? Yeah, he's like, nope. <laughs> he said he's got to, it's not fun to go around curves like this because it just feels like you're like, okay, I'm going to fall over at any given time going around this corner. It's just slow. So when, you, when motorcycles go off those off ramps, a lot of times we have to adjust our velocity to keep that centripetal force up because of the mass, right? The mass that they're designing the curves for is a car or a tractor trailer truck or something to that effect. So the bigger we make this curve, the easier it is to get around. Here, it's gonna cause a greater skid for a car, right? And it's gonna come around here and if you take the same corner as speed you took this one at, off you go that way into the dirt. This is why I didn't take art class. All right, so this, I'm gonna tell you guys right now, looking at this, this is kind of talking about the tension and the FYI of this. I'm gonna put a big bold letters here. This is FYI, I have to talk about it by the Department of Education. I am not gonna test you on this. Cause this, we get into some more advanced physics. So if I take a string, I have a string here. Oh, well. Come here, Mr. Mouse, you'll work. Ugh. All right. So I got my poor mouse here, right? And I start spinning around in a circle, right? As I spin at a certain speed, it forms a conical pendulum, right? Now, once I get it started, it doesn't require as much force for me to keep it up, right? Because at that point, the mouse starts going into dynamic equilibrium. And all I have to do is overcome the friction of air. So there's only two forces acting on this right now, the gravity pulling down and the tension in the string. What happens if I pull up harder? What's going to happen to the mouse? pendulum is going to become less, right? It's going to become more of a circular. Because what am I trying to overcome the more I pull on the string? What force? What's causing it to raise up? I'm overcoming gravity, right? So there has to be a certain amount of tension this way for me pulling. But at the same time, I can feel gravity is pulling down on this mouse just sitting here. So in order to get it kind of going in a circular motion, the more I pull in the string, the more that mouse overcomes gravity. And you guys are just waiting for me to smack myself in the face as I see it. Ryan's sitting forward, like, come on, do it, do it. So we can express this. And again, I'm going to say, please, this is FYI. I have to talk about it. I don't have to test you on it. What this is literally saying is we have a gravitational force pulling vertically, right? We also have our tension force pulling that way. But what's keeping it in a circle is that centripetal force pulling towards the middle. The greater I increase this tension force, the greater that centripetal force is going to become. 
So the more and more I pull and sort of speed that up, and if I increase the speed as well, that can help overcome that gravity, that cone will slowly flatten out, right? In order to get out to this space out here, I actually have to overcome the force based upon that, that cone, right? Which if you look back at the actual force on the cone, it's MV over R squared. Don't have to know that formula. Do not write that formula down. It just is, right? Which looks a lot like the formula used to calculate the actual inside volume of that cone. And in a way, they're kind of relations. There is a relationship. They're proportional to each other. So the, the more volume that cone has, the wider I'm spinning in the circle, I require less of a tension force to pull upwards in order to get it to go in a more horizontal arc. So that's it for that one. So here we have cars going around the track. Right? Again, I'm a big NASCAR geek, so it, it just live with me a little bit, right? Centripetal force keeps these cars on the track. If you ever get to, and if you haven't ever watched a race like this, just watch it once at one of the flatter tracks and watch it at one of the bank tracks and see the difference in speed cars are able to attain. Because on that bank track, it kind of creates that same feeling you get on that amusement park ride, right? Where the track actually increases the friction because it's banked. Uh, this is actually the bank at, I think, turn three in Daytona. But look at it, it's 31 degrees. If you ever stand up here, if you take and you come up here, where's my little draw? Here we go. Hi, I'm standing in the road. And you stand up there, it's actually difficult. It feels like you're gonna get pulled downhill. That's a pretty, 31 degrees is not a small incline. But as those cars are going around and it hits that circle, a lot of times if you watch the cars going around, they'll bottom out when they hit that circle. Why do they bottom out? Because gravity all of a sudden has increased that uh, force to pull down because they've changed the banking. When the speed is at such that the gravity is not overcome by that centripetal force pulling in, the car is able to keep a steady speed right around the curve. At that point, there's really no friction. It's the banking that's holding the car on the curve. And sometimes when that happens, a driver might get a little overzealous and accelerate coming out of the curve. And unfortunately at that point, gravity may take a hold and then they'll go sliding off and cause an accident. Or maybe their tire wears out and they don't have as much grip anymore. So right now on these cars going around the corner, there's really only gravity pulling them down as their centripetal force because the curve is acting like a wall for their tires. And so when they're going around, they want to exert enough force to kind of get lift on the car so they minimize that friction interaction so they can go faster around the track. Stuff you never need to know. So that's when we talk about this force called centrifuge, right? Centrifuge is a force-like effect. In physics, a centrifuge force is not a real force. It's an opposite to the centripetal force. So this is that feeling when you're in that carnival ride that spins around in a circle, that when you're sitting there, you are being pulled to the center, but it feels like you're being pushed outwards, right? That push outwards is called the centrifugal force or the center fleeing or away from center force. We use this in medicine a lot, right? Anyone in here get their blood drawn recently and do a complete blood count? If you get a complete blood count, they're gonna take one of those vials and put it in a thing that spins it around. And the blood cells all weigh different weights. So what happens is you end up with lighter blood cells down to the bottom, right? Or heavier blood cells down to the bottom and lighter blood cells at the top. And it helps them determine your white blood count, your red blood count, and your plasma count. They use that outward force in order to separate the blood. And that can tell them a lot about you. It can tell them how healthy you are because of your white cell count, you know, what your oxygenation could be like because of your red cell count. But if you're on that, if you put that blood vial in that centrifuge and suddenly the outside wall goes away from the centrifuge, that blood vial will just fly off in a straight line, right? It'll move away from that in a straight line. So the same idea here with the can. If our string breaks right here, 
the can's not going to keep going around in a circular motion, which seems like it would be logical. But it's lost that pull to center. So wherever that string breaks, it's going to go off in a straight line. Somebody throwing a discus in the uh, Olympics or something like that, when you see them spinning around and getting ready to throw it, if they don't stop at the exact right point, that discus is going to go off in a straight line the wrong way. And they may not be counted, right? Because all of a sudden it goes off and hits somebody in the stands and the person in the stands dies. No, just kidding. That doesn't happen, right? But it goes flying off and now it's not going to be able to be tracked because it doesn't follow the design path. So you have to think about those people that do the discus, that do the shot put and whatever that other string thing is called. Um, because they have to have exact precise ability to stop at the right moment to let go of that item so it flies off in the right straight path. That's working on this idea of centripetal and centrifugal force. So when we have this whirling can going around, right? It's often said that it's a misconception in physics that the centrifugal force pulls outward on the can. There's nothing really pulling outward on the can, right? What's pulling is inward on the can is that string. And because that string is acting inward, you feel the pull outwards. What would happen to us here on Earth if all of a sudden the planet sped up? So all of a sudden it went from, you know, 1x it is now to like 5x speed. We'd go faster? Yeah, we'd go flying yeah. off. Yep, we'd go up. <laughs> right? And we, whenever it, wherever it's picked up that speed would be where we go flying off. Now, hopefully there's something to grab a hold of at that given moment. Right? That sounds like a really good sci-fi movie, doesn't it? They haven't done one like that. I mean, they've done Sharknado and, you know, Sharktopus and all those other great sci-fi movies. Maybe they should do one where the Earth spins too fast. So this is why if you've ever seen the original Superman movie, right, back in the 70s and early 80s, there's one where Superman goes out and turns back time by causing the Earth to spin backwards really fast. Physics, first of all, says you can't change time that way. That's beside the point. But if he was actually able to do that, everyone on Earth would fly off the Earth. I guess that would solve his problem. Then all the history would be rewritten. But there would be no way to accomplish that. So in physics, a little bit there. Of course, um, almost all the sci-fi movies of the, the great sci-fi movies kind of take a little bit of scientific liberty, right? It, any of the Star Wars or Star Trek fans, if those space battles actually happen in space, does anyone know what those space battles would sound like? They sound like nothing. Lightsabers. No, it wouldn't even sound like lightsabers. It sound like nothing. In space, if they had those the spaceship battles where they're shooting at each other and blowing up, it'd be completely silent. There's no air to transmit the sound. So when the Death Star blows up, there wouldn't be a lot of boom. It would just be... Right? Think of how boring that would be. There'd be no laser pew pew sounds because there's no sound to reflect it. That'd make a boring sci-fi movie, right? Get a lightsaber effect. I always, you know where they got the sound for the lightsaber, by the way? They got the sound from those electric uh, bug zappers. That's what it comes from. When you turn those on, especially the old ones, they buzz up like that. That's where they got the sound, which is hilarious. Fun fact. Use my phone real quick. So again, you get on one of those carnival rides and let's actually, let's not, let's put you on the one that's the, the, the true centrifuge type ride where you're standing against the wall and it starts spinning around in a circle. The floor drops out from you. The thing holding you up against the wall, you would think is that centrifugal force pushing you outwards. But really what's holding you up against the wall is the wall itself. The wall is actually enacting a force inward based upon the pull of that centripetal force. And that's what keeps you smashed up against the wall as you spin around in a circle. Let's say you get down to the link and you get on the high roller. And all of a sudden the high roller starts malfunctioning, which is my, again, my big terror on rides like that. But all of a sudden, instead of stopping somewhere, it just starts spinning around rapidly. What's gonna happen inside those cars? Where are you going to end up? 
In the ceiling. On the ceiling, yeah. Or what, whatever ends up towards the out, right? Maybe they tilt out and you're actually smashed against the floor. I don't know how they have the safety design on that. But you have to imagine there's actually a engineer who designs those specifically that if that should happen, people won't die. You gotta think about that. They actually designed it so that if that should happen, because that the science behind designing those big Ferris wheels is ridiculous. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're a magnet against the wall, right? Exactly. I can't imagine what that would be like on the high roller. That would be terrifying. Just looking around and seeing Las Vegas turn into spinning lights. Oh, I'm getting nauseated thinking about it, right? So again, we have our little ladybug out here in this can, right? She feels like she's being pulled this way, but because this can has a back end, it's exerting that pull inward to keep her inside the can. If you keep spinning it fast and faster and faster and faster, there's a chance that she can become squished, right? The same idea of you know getting on the link and getting squished. But there's really no outward force acting on the can that you feel, it's just the reverse of the centripetal. So here's our, look, here's our go to ladybug. Right? So the can provides a centripetal force to hold the ladybug in the can. So let's say we were able to get a ride like this and we're able to stand up and it's just enough centripetal force that we can stand inside the can horizontally. What would happen if we threw a ball? Would we be able to catch it right back to where we are? Yeah, we would. Because just like in a car, right? What happens if you're in a car driving down the road and you throw that ball up? The ball lands in your hands, right? Because of the ball having the same acceleration that you do. Same idea. If you throw that ball up, that ball is moving the same acceleration you are. It's actually kind of a wild thought process on that. You would think the ball would go smashing against the wall, but that disobeys the laws of physics. It's moving at the same speed you are. I don't know why we'd want to do that trip, but that would be kind of wild. So what's wild when you have this here is this ladybug actually, and you can do it if you're on one of those rides, you can almost walk straight up those walls of that carnival ride. You can inch yourself up the walls as it's spinning around because it's overcoming the force of gravity on you. I don't know why you'd want to do that because then when the ride stops, <laughs> gravity's going to take over again. But I remember I had a, one of my friends that that was one of his big things. He would try to see how high up the wall he could get at Hershey Park, and then the ride would stop and he'd fall and he'd laugh. Again, I grew up in a redneck area. That was what we did for fun. So the faster and faster this can spins around, the more the effect of gravity is getting negated against this ladybug. So then let's think about something else because take it take physics a little bit further. What happens if all of a sudden the sun's gravitational pull gets affected and it pulls a little harder and causes us to spin around our circle around the sun faster? Is that going to affect pretty much everything on Earth? If all of a sudden we sped up from 100,000 meters per second to 200,000 meters per second? Yeah. That speed, because that velocity is squared, it's going to drastically affect things on Earth here. It's going to affect our day, right? Our rotation is going to be different. I, I wouldn't doubt it's going to affect our tides and affect everything else as well. So hopefully the sun stays the way it is for a very long time, is what I'm saying. Because bad things can happen if the sun gets changed. So when we talk about that centrifugal force, right, it's an effect of the rotation. But in physics, it's not a true force, right? And the true force is something we can be, that we can quantify. We can't quantify this force. We know that it exists and it's the opposite of centripetal, but we have no quantifiable formula that we can use to tell us what that actually is. So when we look outside from the reference frame of the ladybug, she feels that force going out, right? From a stationary frame outside, we see there's no central rotation. She's just laying against the can, right? I guess I'm being sexist there. It could be a he ladybug. But we do see the centripetal force, that circular motion acting on the can. So it's really important when we talk about stuff, about the reference we're talking about. 
if I'm talking about looking from something on the outside or looking at something from the inside. And that's going to come into play when we start talking about more of the forces of the atom and stuff like that as well. So it appears as the force is on right as the pull of gravity, but there's a fundamental difference between the gravity-like centrifugal force, which you feel, and true gravitational force. Gravitational force itself is the pull of the earth due to inertia. Centrifugal force is that push that you feel because of the centripetal force on the can, right? Gravity is the effect of one mass on another. So that being said, let's say you gain 200 pounds tomorrow. Does your pull towards earth feel different? Yeah, right? Because all of a sudden you've got that extra, you have 200 pounds, you've got an extra 100 newtons or 100 uh, kilograms, so an extra thousand newtons of force pulling you down. So when you look at it that way, because of looking at the centripetal force of gravity, think of what something just as simple as gaining five pounds does to the human body, right? You wouldn't think it does much, but even five pounds, you know, we're talking about, what is that? That's so uh, two kilograms-ish. So you're talking 20 Newtons of extra force. That's 20 Newtons of extra force on your spine. That's 20 Newtons of extra force on your knees. It's 20 Newtons of extra force on your ankles. What's that gonna lead to in all those joints? Breakdown. Right? That's where this kind of comes into play when we look at the human body and why this is important to understand this. So a lot of times it's, I see, I'm, and I, if, you're, if you've got a little extra weight, I'm not picking on you. Please don't think that. I've got plenty to get rid of myself, right? But the idea that you can be big and healthy just doesn't hold weight at that. Oh, that was a bad pun just doesn't hold water at that point. Because any extra weight you put on your body is causing extra stress on the joints. So we all have a certain BMI that's kind of ideal. BMI doesn't really come to play very well anymore, right? Because we know that there's more to life than BMI. We used to think that was the only given factor, right? But if you got somebody like Jason that's got guns, you know, that affects his BMI because muscle has a little bit more weight by mass than adipose. So BMI is not perfect, but BMI is a good judge. What BMI helps us understand is if you have a higher BMI, you have a greater chance of having health problems. So looking at a person who maybe is say 350 pounds and they consider themselves healthy, right? If you look at BMI wise, for somebody to be 350 pounds and be healthy, they'd probably have to be like eight foot nine, not five foot four. Or five foot four, the average is about, I think 130 pounds is max in BMI to be healthy. Don't quote me on that. I'm just kind of thinking off the top. So if we do the difference between, you know, say 350 to 130, right? That is a huge difference. That's 220 pounds. That is an extra 100 kilograms or 1,000 newtons of force on all of that person's joints. What's going to be the long-term effect of that gravitational force pulling down on those joints, that centripetal force pulling down on all those joints? Breakdown. Breakdown, right? Which ones are going to break down first? The knees? Probably the knees. Hips. In the hips, yep. And why are those gonna break down first? Because those are our most weight-bearing joints, right? And we're gonna learn in Therex, once the knees kind of break down, the hips are next. Because when the knees break down, the hips start absorbing all of that ground force. Once the hips start breaking down, where does the ground force get transferred to? Spine. The spine, exactly. Right, which is why a lot of times if you have somebody that's overweight, a lot of times they'll come in complaining of knee, hip, and back pain. And so, you know, you tell, and I've had this discussion with patients that you talk to them, you're like, let me just kind of break it down for you. And I, I actually just had this conversation with a friend of mine, and it was a little bit maddening that the reason why you're having so much force because he is 425 pounds and thinks he's healthy. Um, 
Again, not really possible, right? That's just not physically possible. But he's complaining about hips and knee pain, and he's starting to get back pain. And the reason he's having that is because of that extra gravitational for force. Well, how could you become healthy at that weight? Well, if you converted all of that adipose into muscle, you could probably overcome some of that force. But even when you talk to bodybuilders, the guys that literally are just nothing but walls of muscle, guess what they complain about? Knee, hip, and back pain. So, uh, Mr. McKeever, I have a yep. question. Sure. Does it ever get down to ankle pain? It can. Yeah, the ankle, the way the ankle is designed as a mortise joint, it can get down there. But a lot of times that ankle is one of the, the way the ankle gets pain is when they do stuff that rolls the ankle, right? Because then you have all that extra force rolling that ankle a certain direction. The ankle is kind of designed to transmit all that force right up the leg. So it's not really about the weight, it's just like dispersing it? Yes, the weight gets dispersed. You're exactly right. Yep. Because let's say you're walking and you have all that force that, you know, you're 450 pounds and you step off a curb and turn your ankle to the outside. Now you've got that extra thousand newtons of force pushing down and the ankle's coming up, probably going to break an ankle versus, you know, somebody like Brooke does that. It's going to hurt. She's going to limp for a couple days, but she'll get over it. She'll probably say some not so, nice, not so nice work words, but she'll get through it. it that's the kind of the difference of that centripetal force acting on us is it affects our health. Also think about all of the organs in the body. Are the organs affected by gravity? Yeah, right, I see people nodding their head. So now you've got, you know, an extra thousand newtons of force pulling down on the heart. That can cause some serious problems, couldn't it? Because now the heart's already working, really. Hold on a second. So yeah, so now the heart's already working overload because you've got all that extra body mass, right? Because it's got to pump that extra blood, but now you're ad exerting a gravitational pull on it. And that can stretch all those ligaments that hold the heart in place. So there are multiple reasons why the, the more you get past your healthy BMI or your healthy weight, it can cause a lot of problems on your human body. And that's, it's one of the things we have to talk about. It's not a fun conversation to have with your patient, right? I didn't like having it with my friend to tell him, look, dude, you probably got about 200 pounds to lose at least. And then maybe your knees will feel bad because he went to the doctor and he's actually got complete knee breakdown on his right knee and the doc won't do surgery on him. Do you know why the doc won't do surgery on him? too heavy. And what's going to happen if the doctor replaces that knee with the total knee replacement? What's going to happen to that replacement he does? Break. It's going to break. Exactly. That's why a lot of doctors will say, if you're that heavy, you have to lose 20% of your body weight. They're not saying that because, you know, they want to be mean to you. They're saying that I, if I put this in you and you're at your current weight in six months, it's going to be destroyed. Are there also complications during surgery? Oh, yeah. That was the other thing, right? Yeah, right? The larger you are, the more you're at risk to die on the table. You know, from multiple things, from blood clots, from, you know, the same thing, the, uh, the same friend I'm talking about, and I, I, I talked to him before this, telling him I was going to use him as an example today. He wasn't very happy, but he agreed to it. He has a really, really bad cholesterol. He has hyperlipidemia. Right? So he literally, he has fat particles floating in his blood. He has so, such a high cholesterol. You know, he goes in for surgery. Is that going to put him at risk to have a stroke? Yeah. Right? And also laying on his back for so long, you got to think about it. He's a big guy, right? He lies on his back getting the surgery. He's under anesthesia. Now all that weight is crushing down on his inner organs. Other problems can occur. I can understand the surgeon saying, hey, look, I'm not going to do surgery on you unless you do this. Because reality, him laying on the table is another centripetal force crushing his organs. And that was one of the things like, well, I guess I can understand that because I can't sleep lying down anymore. I have to sleep sitting up. That makes sense, right? Uh, so here we have, uh, I don't know why this is, in here. This is silly. 
Uh, this heavy ball attached by a spring to a rotating platform shown in the sketch from two observers. One is rotating frame. It appears at rest from both persons. The person outside sees that ball spinning around, but that kid sitting in the middle, the ball stays at the same spot. It just gets further and further away as that string stretches. So this is talking about looking at things from a certain perspective. That's about all I wanna cover on this slide. So let's apply this more physical therapy wise here because I kind of wanna hit that a little bit harder here. Let's talk now, we're doing some exercise with the patient and that patient actually has excess adipose on their arms or maybe they have lymph, uh, lymphedema where they have swelling in their arms. And you're having them do shoulder exercises where they're raising stuff up and above their head. Is that causing extra force on that shoulder joint? Yes. Yeah, right? That centripetal force, that force coming in, right? Is causing that humeral head to further grind. Where does that humeral head sit? What, what anatomical location? Test of anatomy. What's the splenoid cavity? Splenoid cavity, good, right? So even if you're healthy and that arm goes up, there's a certain amount of force acting on it. What keeps that humeral head when it's rotating around inside that glenoid cavity? What's gonna keep it stuck in there and not just fall out when you rotate it around? The ligaments. Ligaments. The ligaments, right, part of it. And then your muscles right. as well, right? your supraspinatus, and then also your deltoids are gonna keep it in there. So they're gonna act as what's called a force couple. So every time you move your shoulder, and whether you guys know it or not, you'll learn about this in anatomy, all those muscles are working in conjunction with each other, right? Because not only does your shoulder have to move, but your scapula has to move. If your scapula doesn't move, right now, if you take your hand, put it up on your shoulder and lock down on your scapula for me. Everyone do that. So pull down so that scapula can't move. Now try to lift your arm up. You hit a part where it just doesn't want to go any further. It's not happening. It's not happening, right? Because you've locked out that scapula. You have changed the way that centripetal force works. Ow. <laughs> Mr. McKeever? Yep. On the first example that you were saying, if someone um had a little bit more weight in their arms mm -hmm. are they is it possible that they're um they could give give out more like Absolutely. if the weight, it'll give out quicker well yeah because you gotta think about it so now that super spinatus has to work extra hard to hold in place right mm -hmm. so as they're raising it up and that extra force is pushing down did you guys learn about the labrum that goes around the glenoid cavity yet did you talk about that a little, I see work on it, right? There's a little lip that goes around your glenoid cavity called the labrum, right? That labrum helps form a suction cup to keep that humeral head in there. Well, as that arm goes up, right? So here's my arm and I start rotating up in that glenoid cavity. As this supraspinatus is not able to overcome that weight, that head is gonna sublux, which is called when it drops down and it's gonna impinge on that labrum. And the more and more it impinges, the more and more it's gonna rub away at it. And then eventually what's gonna to happen to that labrum? Tear. It's gonna tear, right? And that's where you get an inferior labral tear, right? And so now that's torn down there. So now there's nothing to keep that, the bottom part of the head sucked into the socket. So what's gonna to happen to the head? Boom. Right, you're gonna get an inferior dislocation of the shoulder because you no longer have the structures in a patent function to hold that shoulder in there. Just something as simple as that, a few extra pounds can affect that shoulder greatly. Now, what if you got, you know, you, you got somebody that's going to become a you know, bodybuilder and he's building up his biceps. What else should he build up at that point? Well, all of the associated structure in the shoulder, right? And I, I've actually seen it. I love when I see people in the gym that are like trying to get the gun show going and you look at their shoulder and like their upper trap is like this big, right? All their, their shoulder, because I'm sitting there going, that's just job security for me because he's going to be in therapy in a few months. Because the bicep and the weight of the arm is going to be worse. Yeah, right. I, I look a lot at job security when I'm at the gym. 
the weight of that arm is going to eventually affect all those other musculature. And it happens, right? Also, those guys that skip leg day, right? Never skip leg day. You, you guys have seen the guys at the gym that are like ripped up here and then have chicken legs. Well, now their center of gravity is thrown off. So now all those forces on the legs are greater and they don't have the muscles there to help balance out that. Now, it doesn't mean you have to get huge ripped legs, but it, what it means is if you're going to work one part of your body, yeah, top heavy, right? If you're going to work one part of your body, you've got to work the other to overcome that gravitational pull, that centripetal force pulling down. Let's think about a stroke patient now. So now I'm a stroke and I've got this shoulder that's my weak side, right? And I can't, my, that supraspinatus isn't working. Well, because that supraspinatus isn't working, that shoulder is going to slowly drop down, right? Centripetal force is pulling down on that shoulder. Anytime I try to move it, I'm not going to be able to move it because the, the humeral head is now sitting down here. So we have to realize that in physical therapy and go, oh, well, the mechanical advantage is no longer there because it's no longer in the fossa. We can do a superior mobe on that shoulder. And it's amazing. We pop it back kind of up into where it should be. And the patient may be able to lift their arm up because they're now able to overcome that centripetal force pulling down. You wouldn't think that physics plays too much into this part, you know, with when we're talking about you know, physical therapy and that, but it does. Hip, same idea, right? We could go over the same thing with the hip. Let's talk about the knee because that's the kind of last thing I want to hit today on this because actually I'm finishing early for once. For the knee itself, right? What are our, what bones interact at the knee? What are the, what are the main bones? Come on, guys. This is a gimme. Tibia femur. and femur. Tibia femur, and femur, femur, right? We have one other on the floater. Oh, I'm sorry, femur. Right? Patella. The patella, right? Does the fibula have much to do with the knee? No. Not really. Yeah, the fibula is kind of there playing second fiddle. That's what I always kind of think of it as. The fibula is more about bone of balance because it helps out when we get down to the ankle. If you look at the lateral malleoli, they actually go, extend further than the medial malleoli. That's to help keep you in balance, right? So fibula, not too much the knee. Do we have a rotational component of the knee? Yeah, right? Because we got those nice condyles and we have that articular surface of the femur where that tibial plateau kind of rotates around and goes up. When that tibia goes up, it doesn't purely go straight up. There is also a slide that goes into place. So it rotates anteriorly and starts sliding slightly posteriorly to get locked in. So that plateau now is fully in contact with the femoral condyle surface, right? That intercondylar surface. That's what allows you to kind of stand up nice and straight. You wouldn't think there's rotation there, but there is a slight rotation. We'll also talk in, in kinesiology how there's actually a medial and lateral rotation of the femur or the tibia as well, but we're not getting into that right now. Well, what would happen if that slide didn't happen? Well, that's where we get into that EF centripetal versus centrifugal force. Because what will happen is, if that slide doesn't happen, that tibia can literally roll straight off the front of the femur, right? And anteriorly translate on the femur. Good news is, we have something in our knee designed to stop that, right? We have a ligament designed to stop that. What ligament do you think stops that from happening? ACL. The ACL. Good, right? Makes sense. That's one nice part of anatomy, at least. With the ligaments of the knee, at least they name them appropriately, right? The ACL helps trans prevent anterior translocation. The PCL prevents posterior translocation. Thank God. At least they did something logical, right? So that ACL comes into play. And if we would get to the point where we'd start sliding off, that ACL will say, nope and the stretchness or the elasticity of it will pull that tibia back into place. Now you're out playing soccer one day and you're getting ready to kick the ball and some other guy comes in to kick the ball the opposite way and his tibia impacts right at your kneecap. 
And so now your tibia rolls off. What's probably going to happen to that ACL? Tear. Tear, right? And you're going to have to have a repair. Now, can we function without an ACL? Yeah, yeah somewhat. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I'm living proof. My left ACL is gone. They repaired it once. The doc said, I'm not going to repair it again. So I tore it a second time. So now I've got a problem. And we'll actually do this when we get into kinesiology. You can actually move my tibia like this. Like a good four inches on the femur. It's kind of gross. You can actually pull it. So that means when I stand up, I have to use a different method to lock that knee in. So I use the popliteus. I didn't, I, it's not like I trained my popliteus that way, right? The popliteus is the little muscle in the back of the knee. It just became through physical therapy that I started using that to pull the knee backwards. But if I didn't, every time I stood up, my leg's gonna do one of these, right? I'm gonna get that backward knee posture and that's gonna be painful. It's gonna lead to further breakdown. Now, what are the chances I'm gonna need knee surgery in the future? Probably right? Because I'm causing unnecessary wear and tear on the knee. But I'll wait till I'm like 70 on that, which is only a few years away. Um, anyway. So what could I do overall to decrease the chance of the knee breakdown? I could lose more weight, right? That would definitely, you know, for every, you got to think about this for a second. For every 22 pounds somebody loses, they're reducing the force at their knee by a hundred newtons. So for every, if you drop 22 pounds, the force on the rest of your body is dropped by a hundred newtons. That's actually not a small amount, right? So now you got somebody that loses 82 pounds. They've lost a ton of force on their body and they may actually have to learn how to walk better now because they've got a totally different gait cycle now. But that's kind of looking at how this centripetal force comes into our human body. The centripetal force is what causes most of our wear and tear. What about at our neck? Do we have problems with centripetal force of our neck? Yeah, right? Think about it for a second. When we do stuff around the house, right? As we turn, as we do stuff, we're creating that centripetal force either laterally, anterior, posteriorly, stuff like that. That's going to wear down on our structure of our neck. The good news is our spine and our neck is designed to be super mobile, right? What are the vertebrae like in the neck compared to the lower back? They're really tiny, right? They're designed to kind of move everywhere. That's why we have all that motion up here that we can get through, right? We got anterior flexion, posterior flexion, lateral rotation, right? And we can even do the fun rolling of our head. Right? Can't do that with the wrist. Doesn't work that way. Now, oh, come on, roll, roll. <laughs> what could cause, what kind of forces can cause breakdown of the neck, though? What about a car accident? Whiplash. Whiplash. Good, right? Whiplash is nothing more than looking at the centripetal force, right? So I'm going to get in a car accident. My head's going to whip. My, first of all, my body's going to move forward. So my head's going to move with it. Suddenly, I come to a sudden stop. Which way does my head go? backwards and then back forwards because my neck that the anterior longitudinal ligament on my spine is going to whip me back forwards to keep my spine from separating so that whole time that's happening right my head is getting a pull this way because of the weight of my body what's probably likely to happen on my neck well i'm likely to strain a lot of ligaments right and patients likely to have cervicalgia pain in the neck that's what i am to some of you guys cervicalgia pain in the neck I don't know, some of you guys, I might think I'm pain somewhere else, but that's okay. What about all those, what's the downside to those bones being small like that? They don't have a lot of mass, so they're easy to what? Break. Break, yeah, right? So now I get that extreme flexion backwards and extreme flexion forwards, I'm likely to snap bones in my neck. And you guys got to see a little bit of the bones before you uh, ended up on a little bit of a quarantine here, right? You saw those cervical vertebrae did you see all those little lamina and the pedicles on the sides? They're itsy bitsy little structures, especially when you get up to like C2 and C3, and actually C3 and C4, are probably the best options. C2 is a little beefy. 
right? But even at C2, you've got that nasty bump in the back that holds the rotation. What's that bump in the back called? The dens, good, right? The dens is what kind of works with C1 to cause rotation. Well, guess what can happen sometimes in a car accident? Because of that centripetal force of the head coming forward like this, guess what can happen to see that dense? Yeah, it can snap, right? And when that snaps, you end up with what's called a hangman's fracture. Why do you think they call it a hangman's fracture? Because guess where else it occurs? When someone gets hung. We don't do that as much anymore, thankfully, right? Um, but now let's say that snaps off. Now think of the centrifugal force of your, the centripetal force of your head. Your rotation's still gonna be there, but you're gonna probably be able to over-rotate. Yeah, because that bone's not there to keep you in stock. Not only that, but if you try to roll forward, you have nothing to lock you in place. So now if I snap that dens and I come forward, that dens snaps off, my skull and my C1 can slide forward and squish the spinal cord. Spinal cord gets squished, what probably happens to us? Paralyzed. Paralyzed or worse, death. Because that's so close to that brain stem, you can shear really easy there. But that's how, you know, car accidents and all that, when you have bad car accidents, that's nothing more than looking at the centripetal forces at work. It is scary, right? Use one more example, then I'll let you guys take a break. Lifting. Right? How, do, how should we lift? With our what and not with our what? Bend your knees, not yes. your back. Yes, bend your knees, not your back. Why? Well, because you can really mess up your back lifting stuff that's heavy. Right? This will become extremely, we will act, I will, by the time we are done with physical therapy, you guys are done with my classes. If I see you bending over to pick somebody up, I'm going to like throw something at you. Because when you bend way over, all I want you to think about is every time you bend way over to pick something up, you are shortening your physical therapy career. Because even something as small as picking a book up off the floor that way can end up straining something in your low back. Because when I bend forward like that, now when I come back, right, I'm creating that same centripetal force that my body has to overcome. So I feel, my spine will feel a centrifugal force going this way. So my muscles have to resist it with the pull going backwards. But I've got all this top heavy weight here that's hard to control. And that's where you can end up with that low back strain because your body can't hold that weight, right? Any of you that have kids have probably experienced this at some point where the kid comes running at you, mommy, daddy, and they run at you and you're at one of these positions and all of a sudden they tackle you and your back kind of gets stretched out. You're like, oh, that didn't feel so great, right? Mothers that have new babies, a lot of times when you look at the way postnatal care products are designed, like changing tables, cribs, they're not designed to help your back, right? Changing tables are normally about the normal height of a desk. That means you're going to have to bend over at the back to change the baby, right? It'd be better for them to be high. Why do they make the changing tables low? Because that way if baby falls off, it's a smaller, it's lesser of an injury, right? But in the long term, you're hurting mom's back or dad's back. I'm not going to say that mom's the only one changing diapers. That would just be if I had a mom or had a significant other with a kid because I can't change diapers. I just can't do it. No. So that's that, that's that centripetal force coming into play. Now, the good news is at our lumbar region, our vertebrae are really, really strong. Right? Those vertebrae are big and beefy. So it takes a little bit more force to cause an injury. But now let's say you pick something up and instead of just bending over, you do one of these and you rotate with it. So you bend down, rotate and pick something up by bending at the back. Now you have caused a double centripetal force to happen because you've got a rotation horizontally and a rotation vertically acting on all that spine. And that is just a back injury waiting to happen. I saw a guy before the uh, pandemic. I don't know what he was actually doing, but he was doing where he had the cable up here, the cable was down at the bottom. He was bending all the way across his body and pulling the cable way out here. 
And I'm just like, oh, oh. I, like I'm walking on the treadmill going, oh man, I can just feel my back hurting from that. And funny enough, he gets done and he's like, and he goes and does the other side. What are you doing? Right? And it's going to be especially important with your patients because we're not going to be dealing with tiny patients. I'm going to warn you now, by the time you guys are out of school, we're going to have bigger patients even yet. It seems like the more we go along, my, the patients that I'm seeing are getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And either that or I'm just getting older. I'm not sure which it is, but probably a combination of both. And the days of seeing people that are 120, 125 pounds in the hospital are pretty rare nowadays. Most of the time it's 200, 300 pound patients. And if you work at some hospitals at the bariatric wing, you may see an 800 pound patient. If you bend over at the spine to lift that patient, you're going to rip muscles. But does that make sense how this kind of comes into play with our human body then? I wanted to make sure you understood why we were talking about centripetal force because it's kind of an abstract concept until you apply it to the human body. And then when you apply it to the human body, you're like, oh, well now I understand why we're doing this. Some of the physics like that conical pendulum thing absolutely has no application to the human body at all. That's why I said, FYI, we move on. But the centripetal force does have something to play with the human body. All right, I'm going to stop sharing here. And I actually ended up just about on time. Are there any, you had a 700 pound, pit? yeah. The biggest I've seen is 845. And ironically enough, he came back into the outpatient clinic six months later and was down to like 430. So at least he taken it seriously, but man. He, he, the funny thing was he could walk. You just had to get him out of bed. He couldn't get out of bed on his own. Once he got up and standing, he could take about 10 steps. But just think about all that. Yeah. Think of all that weight pushing down. Cool. Any questions? <laughs>